Hey guys, this is Eric Young, and you're listening to Book in the Territory. Hey, this is Ring of Honor Superstar Donovan Dijak, and you're listening to Booking the Territory Pro Wrestling Podcast. This is a one-man gang. You're listening to Booking the Territory Pro Wrestling Podcast. This is Booking the Territory, a pro wrestling podcast hosted by Mike Mills, Heart Body Harper from Wildcat Sports and Entertainment, and the mentally irregular Doc Turner. This podcast is a mix of your topics and thoughts in the world of pro wrestling, along with interviews and discussions with current independent stars and your favorite stars from the past. And now, here's your host, Mike Mills. All right, y'all, welcome back to this week's episode of Booking the Territories Pro Wrestling Podcast's YouTube channel and our episode this week, which will feature an interview with the California stud, as he was known in the 90s, the early 90s at least, late 80s, California stud Rod Price. Some of you may know who he was from the Global uh, Wrestling Federation days out of the Sportatorium. He came in as world class, was, uh, was uh, I, would, I don't want to say dying, but it was in his later years, to be fair, to world class championship wrestling. Um, he was a part of world class at the very end. And then he became a part of uh, Global. Uh, I met him on the Indies in the mid '90s, and uh, he was he was a mentor to me in, in very much any number of ways. Man, really, really, really helped me out along the way. Great, great dude. The California stud Rod Price. Some of you know him as a uh, Hardway Rod Price, and some of you may know him as a uh, Rugged Rod Price. Uh, from his, uh, I believe it was in ECW days when he worked for, yes, Extreme Championship Wrestling. He was uh, he was there, I, I want to say, towards the end of time uh, when ECW was going into its final years. Even even before their final years, Rod was working for ECW um, during 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 their uh, during their later years. Uh, I know he wasn't there in like '96 or so, but Rod's got a long and um, and a long journey in the world of professional wrestling. He has been around the world. Uh, to many different organizations, uh, Japan, Europe, um, just just to name a few. So, Rod Price, a uh, good friend of mine, still to this day. Now, this interview that you're going to hear is from June of 2015. It has been up on our uh, normal podcast feed for over a year now since we've been doing the audio podcast. So, But I've been getting requests to put up on the YouTube channel, and I noticed that it wasn't up on there. So I said, let me go ahead and load my, my, my good friend Rod Price's interview up on the YouTube channel. So for anyone out there who does not do audio podcasts and finds YouTube more user-friendly, well, here it is. Um, I would only ask that if you do enjoy this episode with the California stud Rod Price, check out the rest of the ones we have. I mean, I've sat there. I've talked to the one-man gang. I've had on Sam Houston from the Territory Days. We've had on Eric Young, uh, current NXT star, as as I am uh, sitting here recording this on July the 3rd of 2016. We have had on the Beer City Bruiser, current Ring of Honor star. We have had on Donovan Dijak, you know, just to name a few of the stars that we have had on our show. Aiden O'Shea, current TNA Impact on Pop star, has been on the show as well. So check those out on, um, a lot of those are up on our YouTube channel. Some of them aren't, uh, but check them out on our on our Booking the Territory podcast feed. If you just search Booking the Territory Pro Wrestling Podcast on iTunes, Podbean, Stitcher, now, you name it, you're probably going to find it. Or every any podcatcher that you use, an application. I know Podcast Attic is a popular one these days. You can find it on there. Just search Booking the Territory and you will find it. Um, and subscribe to us, man. We'd really, really appreciate it. Not only do we do interviews, but we kind of cover the current state of professional wrestling. We do some things called Top Fives as well, where we discuss, for example, the Top Five wrestling managers that uh we would rank between myself my co-host uh, doc turner and hard body hopper from wildcat sports and entertainment so other than that man that's all i got i'm gonna throw it over kick it over to myself rod price i appreciate you tuning in to this week's youtube episode of booking the territories pro wrestling podcast all right everybody i got an old friend of mine uh somebody i give a lot of credit to to Really teaching me a lot of things about the world of uh, professional wrestling, not sports entertainment. And I got the one and only, um, well, when I first saw him in the 90s, uh, back when I was in high school, he didn't know me at this time. He was, uh, at that point, the California stud. What's going on, Rod Price? How you doing? Well, I, I'm not so sure I like the opening, the old part, your old <laughs> friend, you know. <laughs> I'm doing good, Mike. Uh I have no complaints, man. Everything's good. That's good, man. Well, look, first, I'm really glad you uh, 
you had me on or, or you're on my show. It's really good to talk to you. I, it's funny because I don't know. We, we talk on Facebook and, and, and message every now and then, but I, we haven't talked on the phone in how long would you say? No, uh, not a long time. Uh, yeah. Less, in fact, uh, just recently yeah. we, we spoke about uh, the condition of uh, our friend's dad that was in the hospital. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right, that's right. Uh, I, I hope Rusty's dad is doing uh, doing pretty good uh, at this point. But, uh, yeah, he's out, he's out of ICU in a regular room, should be coming home soon. Okay, that's good. That's, that's good. good. That's good news. That is. Well, we hadn't talked in so long, and I, I know we talked through Facebook Messenger and text and whatnot, but I hadn't been on the phone with you. It feels like in a while, so yeah, I'm I just did. gonna, I'm just gonna jump right in. And, uh, so go ahead and, uh, cause I, I, I don't know if people really know the history. You, you've been around this business in the wrestling industry for a long, long time, and. And most people at this point probably are like, oh, I, I didn't realize that, or, you know, it's been so long since they've seen you due to just various reasons and injuries and whatnot. But I'll let you kind of walk me through, you know, your beginnings and, and where you got started, how you got started in the business. I got started uh, actually is about 1981, I guess, is when uh, I was in the junior college and – we had uh, a few of us had opportunities to go do some commercials, and they, these were through the track coach. And mm-hmm. went and did one commercial as a professional wrestler. There was a uh, in California. There was a Miller's Outpost, kind of uh, probably like the uh, I'm trying to think of something to relate to. Uh, it wasn't a Walmart type, maybe more of a Dillard's type, but mm-hmm. dealt strictly, you know, they dealt strictly in uh, a lot of Western wear, and, you know, that was 1980, Urban Cowboy came out, so everybody that had a pickup truck wanted to be a cowboy in California, so. Right. And we did one, a friend of mine that's uh, gone on to be with the Lord, yeah, him and I did one. There's, uh, I was high prices, and I, of course, I was the villain. And uh, he was, uh, my friend was cutting, uh, cutting uh, high prices. So I was already uh, taking a bump and jobbing back then. So, <laughs> <laughs> but Red, oh. Bast- Red Bastine was the. Uh, was a choreographer for the thing. Oh, that's and, how you met him. Yeah, after after the shoot was done, he came up and gave us a card and said, hey, you guys want to get into professional wrestling and come look me up. I never realized that's how you met him. I, I, knew, I knew that's who trained you and how you got your start. I just didn't know that's how it happened. Yeah, and after 81, uh, probably... After football season in 81, which ended in November, uh, I had I had my classes down pretty good. They were early. I wanted to get them out of the way, so I'd go to school early, get those knocked out, and then I'd uh, run out to uh, East L.A. and started training with... Uh, Red Red was done training. Uh, the last class that he actually trained was with uh, Sting and the Road Warrior and and Angel of Death. That was that was his class, and there was a few more in there. Mm, gotcha. But uh, he uh, turned me on to Armando Guerrero, and that's uh, that's who that's who actually trained me. Red was around, but. Mondo did all the on hands work. Okay, no, no, I got you. I see what you're saying. He, he I mean, you credit him for it, but like you said, it was um, Mondo did did the. I'll say the bulk of it, if I'm hearing you right. Right. And okay. And uh, finished uh, 
Phoenix went into uh, train all the way through the summer of the summer of eighty two. Trained through that and played football. Finished school there. Got a scholarship to go to Long Beach State, which was closer. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so when I finished up, when I finished up my training, I was still playing football, but I wanted, you know, professional wrestling was always on the back burner. Wanted to do that, and I would go out to, at the time, San Bernardino. They had the San Bernardino All Star Wrestling, and I'd go out there, and I'd have to wear a hood, and I'd have to, I'd do jobs for them out there because I was. They put me in. Uh, they dressed me up like uh, Friday the Thirteenth. You know, they put the <laughs> hockey mask on me. They called me Jason the Strong. <laughs> Jason the Strong uh, did a lot of jobs, but it, it sure helped pay for uh, gas and some books and getting through school. It was uh, it was a blessing in disguise. Yeah, and uh, went to Long Beach State and finished finished that up. Uh, I started having some tryouts with uh, some pro teams. Hey, hey! I want to ask you real quick before you go to the pro teams because I want to get to that because I, I know about the I, I know a good bit about that, but I want the listeners to hear it too. But um, I remember you telling me a story a long time ago about why you had to wear the mask, and I don't want to talk about it, but it had something to do with the NCAA, didn't it? Yeah, well... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, yeah. Could, and I, I, I think that's really. relevant today because that's what's funny. They're still robbing student-athletes, but that's just my opinion. But I want you to go ahead and tell everybody why uh, you had to wear a hood. Well, I had to wear a hood because if uh, the NCAA found out that I was working professionally, I would have lost my uh, amateur status. Yep. And I, I would have been ineligible. So that's that's the reason why I had to go under a hood. So essentially, uh, we, we stuck it to the NCAA there, and I'm glad you did. Uh, <laughs> yeah, well, I, that's a whole, you know, they should have been paying those athletes way back when, you know. Yeah, it's a long time ago. <laughs> schools make way too much money, but. That's a that's a whole other topic. You and I talk about yeah, uh, that's, things that's being. Yeah, <laughs> chapter. <laughs> <laughs> as a whole, we, we could go down that rabbit hole, but that's a whole other work in itself. <laughs> Oh, you're not kidding. But go go ahead and uh, a- after Long Beach State, you were talking about uh, uh, pro teams and, and professional football, so I'll let you go ahead and tell that part as well. Yeah, after Long Beach State, I had uh, we had our pro days, you know. Then they really didn't have a uh, the combine as they do now. They would just, uh, they sent scouts out everywhere. I ran for every team imaginable that that came through uh Green Bay at one time was was really they were really interested. They uh my biggest my biggest asset was uh being a deep snapper. Yep, I remember that. I I've you, you told me that story. Um which I found interesting but uh that that and I find it interesting because I uh, I remember when we talked about it. Then you told me once you the teams that were you were on, they listed you as a guard. I think, but you never you were really just a deep snapper, right? Yeah, I mean I played I played I played guard, nose tackle, linebacker, all through <laughs> college. Uh, but uh, you know they always whatever roster I was always listed as either a guard or a center. Yep, and the main thing I did was you know long snap. That's what uh, kept me around and it kept the interest from the NFL. And so I snapped balls for a lot of people. Didn't really hear anything, you know. So I started trying to get bookings from San Francisco all through Vegas. I was uh, 
still still trying to get my foot in the door with wrestling. And mm -hmm. uh, they kind of, you know, they were interested, but, you know, since I told them, you know, I may have a chance to go play football, they just uh, continue to keep me under a hood and and just use me as a jobber until uh, <laughs> until probably not until 86 or 87 when I, when I came out and uh, actually wrestled. Uh, my first match with Out of Hood was with uh, Kamala. And oh, what? That was in Indio, California. That was the uh, AWA. I had no idea that was your uh, that was your first match without a hood. But you know, I I was working and doing some stuff, doing some shops in Vegas, doing shops wherever I could get booked. I came home. Uh, I was in Vegas. I came back home, and I had a letter from the Raiders that they wanted to take a look at me, and it was. Within two days, they wanted me to come out and take a look. So <laughs> I went out and snapped balls till my arms fell off for a couple of days. And, and Steve Ortmeyer, he kind of he took a liking to me and hooked me up with the Raiders to do some long snaps. And I hung around with the Raiders for a while, and then. What year was that? That was, oh, man, that was... Best you can remember. Mid-80s. Mid-80s, yeah. I, I figured that. Somewhere around 85, 86, 87, somewhere. And uh, he ended up getting, uh, he didn't get traded, but he went down to San Diego, and they needed a long snapper. So he went to San Diego, thinking I was going to be the, you know, the head long snapper, and... I got down there, and they ended up trading for somebody that was a tight end and a long snapper. So they put me on the practice squads and hung around, <laughs> hung around, uh, <laughs> just picking up a check and never, uh, never got in a game, but had the best seats in the house. Was getting paid, so it wasn't a bad gig. No, not at all. <laughs> I took that job when I was your age. <laughs> and then uh, in uh, right after that, right after that, uh, San Francisco was like a very long snapper, and went up there for oh, I don't know. I went up there for probably four or five weeks and long staff, and they had uh, they had two or three people that could long staff, and they decided, you know, I was the odd man out, so I was uh, released or cut, and after that, that was... Wasn't that it? That was, uh, that was that the was, end of it? Yeah, that was pretty... I was pretty much said, all right, you know, this, I could see where football was going, and so I, uh, <laughs> I headed, headed on to Texas after that. Yeah, now, that's what I was going to ask you, because I couldn't remember what year. I know when I first saw you, I was in high school. Um, I remember that. I remember you in Global, but I, I don't know if you came to Texas for Global or you came to Texas before Global. That's what I was going to ask you today. Yeah, I was, I was with WCW, and I was there when, uh, in fact, I was right there towards the end when... Fritz was selling off uh, WCW to Lawler, and it went to USWA. And now, see, I, I've known you for 20 years, and I did not know you came at the end of Fritz. I had no idea. I, yeah. I, I, I had always assumed it was uh, once Global started, but uh, that's that, that's interesting. I had no idea. Yeah, I came down there, worked... Uh, Work with them. Uh, that's what I hooked up. They 
Steve Austin was still uh, cutting his teeth with Chris Adams through the school and and uh, working Chris's shows. Mm -hmm. and they tagged us together. And how long y'all? How long y'all tagged? I've never asked you that. I know y'all tagged. I just don't remember the length of time, or how much time y'all spent together uh, tagging. How uh, we tagged? We tagged a lot in Dallas. Uh, Steve, I was still, I was still working in uh, around Dallas, used USWA, and there were some other promotions going on, and I was working those. Steve went to uh, USWA for I don't know, a few weeks, uh, and he came back, and he was uh, still trying. He was married at the time, still trying to. You know, send money to his wife and live on the road, mm -hmm. and you know it was it was a hard time for him. And then, yeah. and then Lawler, Lawler, and and Jerry Jarrett came up to us and said, "Hey, you guys want to go to uh, Memphis, right?" Yeah, that's that's yeah. when they completely took over Sportatorium, where we were yep. doing we do it. TV taping in the morning and do a spot show in the afternoon and then leave at, I think it was one of the time we'd leave at midnight and get on a bus and go to Memphis, do Memphis, get there in time to do Memphis TV and then do another spot show somewhere mm -hmm. and get on that circuit of uh, Louisville and Evan uh, went to Evansville and all over. I mean, it was it, yeah, was, it was different. It was not, a different city. Not, that was the end of, Yeah, that was the uh, that was the end of the territories, basically. And uh, for well, for, uh, I'll call them, I call them territories because I've, I've heard actually Steve Austin say that. But uh, from what I remember, just in, again, I was uh, that was that was the end of my high school days. I remember. That being the end of, I guess you can call it the last territory. And but you're right. It was uh, from what I remember and the stories I've read and heard from everyone. It was, it was basically you know different town every night, just like the old territory system. Yeah. Is that correct? Yeah. It was you know it was good experience. I did that for a couple of weeks, and uh, I had an opportunity right after that. They uh, they asked me to go to. Uh, Puerto Rico. In fact, Akbar was going to book, and I think I want to say that was '89 that we went down there, or I went down there because we were the first. We were the first group back after uh, Brody had got killed down there. I knew that. Well, I knew I knew about Brody. I didn't know y'all the first group back down there. Yeah, and it was it was quite intense. <laughs> <laughs> Man, you got more stones than me. Yeah, well, there was a lot of uh, there was a lot of tension between us. I all. bet. But uh, I stayed there a month, and you know they promised so much money. We were going to make so much money here and there, here and there, and it just the it money was happened. there about the first two weeks, and after that they. They started uh, getting in debt with the uh, casinos, uh, <laughs> so our pay dropped. <laughs> and after the anniversary shows, I said, all right, I'm done. I'm out of here. They wanted me to stay, but I didn't want to. There was no way I was going to be down there because Akbar yeah. was leaving. A lot of the guys were leaving. I got, I'm not staying down there pretty much by myself, so. No, I don't blame you on that. I, I did you, you, Like I said, you had more stones than me going down there in the first place after uh, what happened. But uh, yeah, when I got incredible, when I got back, that's when uh, Joe Pettisino had taken over the sport farm and started the the GWF. I, whose name I was trying to remember last night at the show I was at, I was talking to somebody and we were talking about Global, and I could not remember his name. And I know you had told it to me before. 
and I'd read it before, but uh, yeah, I remember that. I'm glad you said that because I can't, it was on the tip of my tongue last night. I couldn't remember who 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 you know got global up and running at that time. Right. And that's uh, I think that's like 1992. And the only reason I remember that I, I know I was in high school at that time, and that's when I first remember California Stud <laughs> on TV. Um, you know, because uh, I'm like many before I even was an indie, you know, and all I ever did was indies, as you know. Before I was an indie guy, I was a fan, obviously, and uh, so I'll let you go ahead and talk about that, the global day but, that you were getting into. But Gary Hart was running. He had the Metroplex Arena. I don't know if you yeah, remember yeah. that. Yeah, I've heard it. Yeah, yeah. No, no, no. I've heard it. Actually, I think there's some stuff on YouTube uh, at Metroplex Arena with you on it, actually. I think it may be something on it with you and uh, Steve Austin uh, tagging. It's yeah, on YouTube. we tagged. I saw it not long we ago. Tagged. We had the... We held the belts for a while. Yep, yep. And I do. I do remember seeing that. And my timeline may be uh, screwed up a little bit, but but I, shortly after that, Steve went to uh, WCW. Mm-hmm. And Steve went to WCW, and that's when we had opportunities to go to, uh, or I had an opportunity to go to Japan. And I jumped on it and wrestled in Japan for many years uh, with uh, Sakurata. Mm-hmm. And we uh, come back. It, it was a pretty good deal because we, uh, we could work global. We could work, you know, these independent shows with, uh, with Gary Hart and Tim Brooks was running. And you know it was uh, at the time everything was was flowing good. And then well, yeah, because y'all y'all had the uh, y'all had the well, ESPN had the TV deal. So I would assume. I mean, heck, I was in New Orleans, Louisiana, watching it. I'm assume anybody who had cable could tune in at I think it was like three o'clock in the afternoon on ESPN uh, Central Time, and they could tune in and see Global. So guys like you. You know, anybody that worked for Global that was getting TV time was getting national exposure at that point. So yeah, they, uh, that was great help. That's what they wanted. They wanted uh, they were targeting that after school audience is what it was for. Yep. <laughs> for ESPN, that's what they wanted. Yep. So we had we had to you know, we had to calm down, couldn't juice, couldn't do a lot of things. Could do a lot of the violent things that we wanted to do. Yeah. So it was pretty uh, diluted in what we did. Yeah. And then, you know, we had, you think about that global with Petosino and the, the roster we had. I mean, we had Incredible. Pack and we had uh, the Karate Kid. I mean, we had it was it was a it was a loaded card, man. And then, as it happens, Vince started taking away talent. Yeah, and he pretty much sucked that territory dry with with the with the main talent. And Joe kind of said, "Okay, I had enough," and then. Max Andrews picked it up, him and uh, Gray Pearson, and they started it again. Yeah, and that's that's, uh, that's right. I remember that there was a little break, wasn't there? there yeah, was a, yeah, I remember that. I, I I do recall that. Now that you're saying it, thank God uh, during that break, I still had still had opportunities to go overseas and wrestle, so I stayed busy, and then. Uh, Pedicino took over, and we would do, on a Friday night, we would do five tapings. I mean, it was it was a long, <laughs> Fridays were long. And that's, uh, that's when they paired Tatum and I up, and they brought I, him. I, I love that. that I got to stop you, because I... Uh... You and Tatum or something else. Uh, again, I was a fan, and, but it was really good. 
<laughs> oh man, it was. I la- I'm laughing because I, I I still can picture like his facial expressions and his mannerisms, and uh, I never met him. Um, you know, I've, I ever. I don't even know if he was working by the time like I met you and and later in the '90s, but it. <laughs> He has some of the greatest facial expressions. Uh, he just oh yeah, John it, it was amazing. John had been around. He went to Mid South with Bill Watts, and and it was uh, it was an experience. But we still had good talent. We still had Eddie Gilbert was still around. They brought in Ebony Express. Yeah, and they brought in the Young Bloods, and so we always had. We always had uh, good talent to work with, and John and I were able to to book ourselves out. We did some a lot of shows in Atlanta and a lot of shows, you know, on our own. St. Louis, Butch Reed had a little deal going. We'd go work for Butch. And, like so I, I said, so we, I didn't realize we, we at that time. Busy. Oh, y'all kept it. Yeah, I, I was gonna say that's what I was about to say. I didn't realize at the time how much uh, how much indie stuff was going on too. Like just outside of global, I, you know, I only saw. You know, I'm a fan. I'm 15, 16 years old. I'm watching what's on TV, so I, that's all I'm seeing. That's all I know. You know, not seeing advertisement for indies at that point. I had no idea that there were even indies that, in you know that 92, 93 range. Yeah, and about 94 things started. You know, they things started falling apart at Global. Uh, I can remember Kevin came in and bought it, and he was. Uh, I'm sorry. Before that, let me back up. Before that, Crockett came back and wanted to start it all up, but he wanted to turn everything back to uh, you know. There was no intro music. You came out dry, and the people are already conditioned for the hoopla, you know, all the bells and whistles. And Crockett didn't like all that, so we <laughs> came out with no music, no no smoke and mirrors, and, the, and that didn't last long. And then People took Kevin, a crap on it, right? Yeah, and then Kevin came in and bought it from Crockett, and it lasted, oh, uh, if it lasted six months, it lasted two weeks. <laughs> but uh, Kevin was, you know, reliving the old days. But thank God Kevin was willing to do uh, independent shows. So you had Chris was booking, Tom Lance was booking. So, again, you know, I was blessed to be able to stay busy because I always worked either Chris or or Kevin. Yeah. And it still had the, the Japan to get going on. And 95, I had an opportunity to go to uh, Europe, the Russell for Otto Vons. Worked over there for, from, I guess, the end of April till December. And I came back, and WWF was interested, so I did a lot of dark dark matches with them. But they just, uh, you know, they had a bald-headed Steve Austin, and then you had a bald-headed uh, Goldberg. So they didn't know what to do with me. But they, they kept... Uh, you know, they kept me busy with dark matches and worked for them, you know, quite a bit off and on. Yeah. And then shortly after that, I went to ECW and wrestled there for a couple of years. And well, late. Let me let me ask you this. So I'm up because I want to get to the ECW part. So. I didn't realize after Global, the whole WWF dark matches, uh, you know, that happened. I, I'm trying to figure out, uh, when did you end up in Louisiana? Because that's when I met you. Um, I, I just don't remember I the year. Well, I want to say it's like 96. 
I guess you March, you were there. I came down, yeah, right after right after I got back from Europe. Uh, Akbar called me and said that uh, they had a guy down there that was uh, promoting, and they were doing four or five shots a week in Louisiana, in Louisiana. and Grizzly. Grizzly was involved, and uh, Sam Houston, Jake was involved a little bit. So mm-hmm. it was, uh, and still going to Japan, and it was uh, still, you know, passion out of living. And then the promoter, as they do, he got the started making money, and instead of putting it in the business, he was put in his pocket, so... That never happens, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and that died off, and that's when ECW kicked in, and I went to work for Paul for two years. Hey, I don't know if people, I don't know if people know this, so, like, you want to you talk about, because uh, I didn't know this uh, until, I, yeah, well, I, I had met you, and then I, I think you told me a little bit later how how you had known Paul, but I, most people don't even know that, how you ended up in ECW. So if you want to talk about, like, how you ended up there, um, you know, go ahead. I, I know you knew Paul before ECW, and that's that's how you got that connection, right? Well, I knew Paul, I knew Paul, and I'd met Dreamer on some of these indie shows. We were working, uh, we were working out of Memphis, and uh, at the time... They were looking for like a training ground, and they had they'd use ECW guys, uh, USWA people. They used uh, you know just uh, the guys that were kind of kind of left around. I think some Portland people came through. Mm-hmm. And what they were going to do is uh, use that as a training ground. And then uh, because the territories had pretty much dried up, they were going to use Memphis as a training ground, and that was going to be, you know, your springboard in the WWF. Gotcha. And that's where I met Tommy. And, gotcha. And I knew... Uh, I met Paul before. We always hit it off, and then got the call. Let's see, I got a. They were coming through Louisiana, and I was just I just finished up like four or five dark matches with uh, Vince, and I met uh, I met ECW in Alexandria. And work for him, work for Paul, and we yeah. came down. We worked in Alexandria. I think we worked in uh, West We Go, and oh, uh, some of Baton Rouge and New Orleans at that point. And oh, it, Chalmette. It, yeah, yeah, Chalmette. Worked in Chalmette. Yeah, yeah. You, and, yeah I remember that actually, because you yeah, at the time, I, at the time you were. You were working indie shows where I was at as well. I mean, we knew each other at that point because I can remember having, you know, just, uh, you know, you you going up. And actually, I remember a couple times, I think I had to pick you up from the airport um, because you were flying in or flying back. from. You were flying from somewhere because I remember picking you up to to be at the indie show that I was at that day. Yeah. I I remember uh, coming in from Atlanta. Yeah, yeah. And being being picked up and... uh, and worked for uh, worked for Don out of Shawmed, and then uh, after after we did, in fact, Gang Gang was uh, at that Alexandria show, so we both we both worked that show, and Paul picked both of us up, and we started uh, running with them. They uh, about four days a week, four or five days a week. We were working for ECW. I remember that when when you were up there and you uh, you were working for them, and uh, it was pretty steady work too for a little while, it seemed. Yeah, it was it was good work for 
about two years, and then uh, the uh, pay-per-views didn't quite go as thought as we thought they should be, and and Paul, <laughs> I guess he got screwed on that deal too. So yeah, we were expecting a little more money, of course, but uh, it didn't come. It didn't come. And his guys were getting were ready to move on, and he had uh, the Dudley boys were getting ready to leave to go to WWF, and yeah. Oh, in fact, uh, him, the Dudley boys, uh, Rob Van Dam, a lot of the guys were uh, getting ready to jump ship. So that kind of put the squeeze on ECW, and they were kind of running out of money. And Paul was, uh, he would fly me in just to uh, be more like an agent and watch the... Uh, watch the shows and put in my two cents and so sure got paid for it. So it was, uh, for me, it was a good way to, I was at the end, you know, I was at the end of my career and I was, I was enjoying what I was doing, you know, it, yeah. was, it, it was good to be part of it. And when I, when I left ECW, when it was over, I was just like, I'm, I'm done, you know, as far as as far as pushing and wrestling. I, I did open up a school out in Gulfport. Yeah, I remember when you uh I me- I I had uh I remember that. I remember you opening up a school and um doing that and I, I know when E C W was done you were you were still kinda of doing independence, but I guess it wasn't you weren't like going everywhere from what I remember. Yeah. No, I was pretty much staying around the house. And I had to school up till uh, Katrina hit, and Katrina wiped out everything. In fact, it wiped out from where we had our school out. It wiped out about two or three blocks above that. I can believe so, it. So we just, uh, I just figured it was uh, time to time to move on. <laughs> Yeah, it gets to it gets to that point, right? You, uh, yeah, you know, you, yeah. <laughs> you kind of, you kind of, uh, you, you, my you, body you was, hit. My body was done. Body was wearing out, so I uh, just pulled out and went on and jumped in the real world and started working. And I still miss it, but the way wrestling is now. It, it, I don't miss it that much. It's a. It, um, I heard. I, I don't want to say who said this, but uh, I can't remember. It was somebody of significant in um in the in the business, and they said uh, it was on like a radio show, and a guy said, "Man," and he was around from your time. Um, that said this. It was, and, and the words that were used were, you know, I don't really want to say this, but to me, it's a wasteland of what it once was, and yeah. like I. I guess, you know, guy, like I didn't see, you know, the, I saw it from a fan's point of view, not from the back point of view that you you all saw it in the 80s and even early 90s. Um, right. But that's that's the words that were used, like a, like a wasteland. It's it's just not what it was. And and even though, like, I see independents now, there are some independents now that are actually drawn pretty good, and it seems like the independents have gotten hot again. Not everywhere. I mean, it, you still got your, you know, shows that aren't worth a quarter, I guess, but... Um, yeah, so but the, the, the words the guy used were it, it just kind of like a wasteland compared to what it once was at one time. Well, when you kill the territories, there's no place for these guys to learn their trade. Yeah. You know, they they wrestle once a month. You know, you're not going to learn anything getting in the ring once a month. No. The way, we, well, the way we learned was being in the ring every night, you know. Right, seven days a week, right? Like you did. Exactly. Sometimes twice on Sundays. Twice on, that's the term I always hear, twice on, seven days a week, twice on Sundays. And like you said, you had those days where you, on Friday, <laughs> five tapers. Uh, I mean, gee, how much more can you do? <laughs> that's exhausting. But Fridays had to be long. And and that's what, they're, that's what uh, WWE is reaping right now. 
they're they've got guys that they brought in some guys that were doing indies, but it wasn't uh, the indie territories where you were going around and working every night. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of guys, you, you know, you hear it on different podcasts or even one of the old timers, they talk about it. It's, you know, they, they'll say, man, you know, before I even got my big break, I, I, I was working for five years, you know, six, seven nights a week. Sure. Well, you do the math, you do the math on that, you know, five years, six nights a week. I mean, you're pushing, again, that's 365, you know, you're out there for 365 times in a year times five years. You you do the math, man. That's a that's a whole lot of matches. Well, that that I'm, you know that's a lot of experience, I should say. We were we were gone. I mean, we were gone two hundred two hundred and fifty days a year. Exactly, exactly. You, and then you, you, you just the other <laughs> right, right. You're gone. You always go. You always kill me because you always uh, you would always tell me. Yeah, brother, you'd have never made it in the old days. Dickie V would have <laughs> ate you alive. <laughs> Dick, Dick, Dickie would have ate you alive because uh, I wasn't much of a drinker. And uh, one thing about most wrestlers, they can put down some beer. <laughs> oh, sure. Yeah, so you going from town to town working shows, putting down some beer. Man, what did you, you used to tell me? Only the strong survive. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it was uh, about, man, at the time. Yeah. I mean, yeah. because I never, I was never a a pill popper, right? Yeah, you know, I always, always drank beer. I didn't start taking pain pills till, man, I was almost thirty six, thirty seven. You were almost I, done, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, it got to the point where you know, drinking beer wouldn't wouldn't kill my pain, and I was never, never one to. Uh, to mix prescription medicine or any other medicine with uh, alcohol, I guess I was. I guess I was too scared, you know, to all the warnings that kill you. And now you you go through the uh, rustling obituaries and you see what you see what killed them all. You know, when you're adding when you're putting steroids and and all kinds of medication in you and alcohol on top of it, you're headed for disaster. Yeah. Yeah, the body ain't made for that. It's just... Absolutely not. I mean, your body takes a pounding enough in the ring. Yeah. Let alone, yeah. you know, being on the road and drinking and popping pills and doing doing what else. Yeah, no, I, I I agree. I mean, at the most, during even when I was, you know, working in these, I, at the most, I only would work six to eight times a month, and that's because, you know, you, know, you got Friday, Saturday night maybe, and I just know even, even doing that, you know, eight times, and I'm holding a regular nine to five, I can remember times when, and I was young, you know, I'm like, man, my body, I feel like I've been in a train wreck, and so right. to do it to do it to your level, six days a week, seven days a week, twice on Sunday, all of those years, it's amazing that people can even you know they can they can even sustain it. I mean, because the body's just not made for it. I, I mean, I can just remember getting hit in a match one time with a couple of chairs, and this is one night on a Friday night, and then having an easy match on a Saturday and. Sunday, I'm like, I can't get out of bed. I'm 25 years old. What's wrong with me? I feel like it might have right. pummeled me. So right. to do it seven days a week, ah, I can't even imagine. It's just, you know, I, I see why. I don't condone it, but I do see why guys end up with the drinking and the pills and whatnot. Cause well, it, sure. Because, you know, you know you, we didn't get paid unless we worked. So, right. you know, if you were hurt and couldn't couldn't wrestle, you didn't get paid. Which 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 is what then you know created the cycle of, man, I can't work unless I'm popping these pills. So I gotta pop these pills. I gotta drink to 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 down it and 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 go out there tonight. And it's just it's a cycle. It continues over and over again. And as you get older, it only gets worse because you know the body just it's not made for it. No, it's the wear and tear. You know, it just eventually it's gonna catch up to you. 
Yeah, yeah. No, no, I, I totally agree. I know, uh, and I know you've had your share of injuries at this point that were wrestling related, and you know it is what it is. You can't. It, it, I mean, how much? How much? Let me ask this: How much of what you've dealt with injury-wise do you attribute to wrestling, and not football? Let me ask that. Uh, wrestling's probably got about fifty percent of uh, my body. You know my joint problems, my back problems are are related to wrestling. Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, that's big. That's big. So I'm taking then, no way in God's name you're getting back in the ring. No, no. I, <laughs> I still, brother, I still love being around it. You know, don't get me wrong. Yeah. I, if the opportunity arises to to be an agent to to help out, I'd be on it in a heartbeat. But uh, yeah, to get to get back in the ring at this age, no way. Yeah, I don't blame you. I don't blame well, you. I, 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 can't, I don't blame you. I can't. I'm. Uh, I've been screwed and metal plated, and <laughs> uh, you know, I just. I can't, body can't take anymore. Yeah, yeah. No, it it, may, it makes sense, man. I, I I do get it. I totally understand. Yeah, I, I kind of feel like you. I, I like going to, uh, I like going to shows sometimes, like any shows. Like I went to the one last night uh, that Randy had out here, and and uh, it was good to see, like, the guys that I know and have talked to and, uh, you know, to see them get out there and do their thing and just to hang out and talk and, you know, shoot the bull. Um, I do miss that. Honestly, that's the one thing I miss more than anything. Um, you know, talking to guys that that, uh, that I know. Exactly. It's, it's, because that's the fun part. I mean, it's the camaraderie. You know, I, I you know, wrestling's fun, but you know, you're only in a ring x amount of minutes a night. It's the uh, you know sitting in the back and talking and chatting and and just uh, just just shooting the bull with with people. I mean, that's a, yeah. that's fun in itself. Yeah, that's uh, that's what I miss the most. You know, just. Catching up on the boys, uh, it, it's sad to say that uh, you know a lot of a lot of my generation are six foot under right now. So that's you know, that, yeah. Not a lot of people left that that I wrestled with that are still alive. Yeah, that, that's that is bad. I mean, it's there's a lot of people. I mean. Uh, Man, I, I think about it all the time because you, it seems like every time uh, there was a point. I don't know if it was ten years ago, maybe about fifteen years ago. It seemed even worse. I swear, every every time uh, every time you woke up, you'd hear about somebody that was no longer there. Somebody passed away. And I'm not talking about from old age. I'm talking from you know, yeah, some pill related or drug related uh, deal. I, I mean. I just uh, just seemed like something that was always happening. Um, it, it doesn't seem like as much now, but like you said, from your generation, there's a lot of guys that are no longer here. Yeah, it uh, it seemed like it came all of a sudden too. I mean, I just got the call the other day about Tommy Rogers. So that one, that one of all the ones that like I can remember recently, because I knew Tommy from you know doing the shows with you in the, in the Indies and. Uh, Man, he Tommy was he just was a really nice guy. I, I don't I just remember him like he put me over twice for one, and I, I'm a, I was a nobody, right? Uh, but uh, you know, just he, no problem. Just said like, he brought me in there and walked me around and talked to me and put me over. Like it was no big deal to him. And that, that was at the time when um when he was doing the up in ECW with you when he was doing ECW shots. Yeah, and yeah. he's on the Indies and he puts me over. I'm like. Never, I, I really, uh, I liked him. He was, he was a cool guy. He, he was real helpful, you know. I, he just meant to hear what happened. I knew he was in bad shape because I had, uh, you know, I had heard about his, uh, his, his ailments with his injuries and whatnot, and, and he wasn't doing too good. But you know, to get that news, I'll let you talk about it because you knew him a lot better than me. Uh, you know, what did you think when you heard it? I, I, it tore my heart in half. First of all, yeah. Because uh, 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 Tommy, Tommy and I, uh, we were close, you know. Yeah, we we uh, we ran in tight groups, but uh, it's you know it's the 
it's the pain that people don't understand that you put your body through. Yep. And, you know, it it's dealing with that pain day in and day out. Yeah. You know, some people, you know, a lot of people just couldn't take the pain anymore. Yeah, they... Uh, I, I yeah. can understand it. I can understand it, man. I believe me. I wake up days when I I just can't get out of bed. Today was Sunday morning was one of them. I was all all hyped up because I uh, was ready to go to church, and my body was saying, "Now you're you're not moving." So <laughs> I uh, I just had one of those days where I just had to lay around and uh, soak and ice and try to try to move a little bit just to get the rust out. But you know, you just have those days, and yeah, you know, sometimes it lasts for a day, sometimes it lasts for a month, and it's just the the constant pain that uh, that wears you out, it wears you out mentally. You know, you try to fight it, but uh, Mentally, it it just it wears you down. Yeah, yeah, and a lot of people, you know, you hear about all this stuff with the uh, with the football, NFL, and and all this, you know, the pain and the, the 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 brain injuries. I don't think a lot of people realize, uh, you know, guys like you, Tommy, who who you know worked every day of the week for years, how much the physical toll is for a professional wrestler and what. What what a wrestler goes through because you know everybody wants to use the term oh it's fake man you have no idea how bad it hurts in there you know for anybody yeah. who and I don't hear it as much as I used to the whole oh it's fake thing and uh, yeah. you know you have a good, you have a guy like one man gang hit you ain't nothing fake about that <laughs> no uh uh-uh. uh <laughs> um, you know so and the thing about Tommy was he was always in like you know he was always cut in great shape you know great athlete. And uh, man, to him, you know, seeing him go down, uh, that was that was sad. That's why I messaged you when I saw it. I'm like, had you talked to him recently? Because I, I really, I couldn't believe it. It was just, I got a text message from somebody else that said it happened. I immediately went online and found out that it did. I was like, oh goodness. Yeah, it was it was a shock, man. I uh, I saw it online and I and I called a few people up and it was true. And I was like, man. Because not you know not only do you you bouncing off your back, but people forget you know when you're when you're jumping off of ropes or jumping through the floor, the pounding that your ankles take. Yeah, that's true. That's true. That's and true. And lot, another, yeah, yeah, that's true. And a lot of guys have uh, have ankle injuries, and they can't. Yeah. Uh, you know, they just can't. It's you know, we didn't have the best health care. <laughs> no, <laughs> definitely didn't have the best pensions. Right. So, uh, you know, yeah. everything we had, you know, we had to, we paid out of pocket. <laughs> and it's, it's hard. It's hard to get good health care and and the really the. Uh, the treatments and yeah, the right it's, it's, uh, it's brutal. The right procedures done to uh, to get us healed. You know, it's not like the football players; they get the best doctors and baseball right. players. You know, you know they're taken care of. Plus, they get a pension. Plus, they get all this. It's like we don't have that. You know, I just oh, yeah. We, we were self-employed, you know. We paid our own taxes. Mm-hmm. We uh, we had to write off our motel and rent a cars and our meals. I mean, it was uh, you did it for the love of the game. That's for sure. And you know, God bless the guys that uh, made some money and were were able to walk away from it, but. Those are far and few between. 
Right, that's seems, in the extreme minority. And the ones, it seems like the ones that finally, you know, they squirreled away enough money to, uh, okay, retire, that uh, shortly afterwards they died, so. Yeah. You know, it's like, it's, uh, it's not good. No, no, it, it, roughly, you definitely, with, with, with professional wrestling, guys put their body on the line in more ways than most people ever realize, and, you know, like you said, you, you know, I, I'm thinking of the, the, just the bumps, but, and even the chair shots, and, because I can remember, you know, there was an old timer, uh, won't say who, but I remember being on a show when I was young, and he goes, "Don't put your hand up for a chair shot." So, you know, like a dummy at 21 years old, I, all right, just blast me in the head, boom. <laughs> um, you know, and, and then, uh, you know, you know, you're young, you're green, and as can be, and you're just like, "Well, oh, this guy's been on TV for 20 years. Let me listen to him." No, um, right. So. Uh, yeah, uh, you know, but you make a great point about the knees and the joints. You know, you're jumping from the ground, you know, from, from high up to the floor. And, hey, let's face it, you know, WWE uses mats. Well, I don't think I ever, or you know, remember a time when you were out there where there were mats on the floor. Um, you probably worked 99.9% .9 of your career where there was no mats. <laughs> uh, no, there so was. Jump. <laughs> you know what I mean? Was, it was wood floor or concrete. <laughs> right, you're right. Wood floor, concrete. Uh, in an arena, generally, that probably had no AC at that point and no heat. <laughs> oh, for the tournament, man, it would be it would be cooking hot in the summer and like an iceberg in the winter time, <laughs> man. I, I tell people that story all the time that you told me about that. You're like, man, in the summertime, you can roast the chicken in there. <laughs> yep, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah, you might be able to fry an egg on the mat. Who knows? <laughs> That's for sure. But, you know, the funny part about it, I can remember the hottest days and the coldest days that 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 place would be packed. Big fans, crowd, huh? Fans would pack it. Yeah. Didn't matter yeah. if it was 110 degrees, people were in there. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, that, that was it, man. Those were the days. It was hot, man. It was uh, literally hot and theater too with the, with the business. Um, people well, coming. We, you know, my we talked about it before when you moved when you moved to Dallas. You're like, oh man, these hundred degree days. Yeah, you get like thirty five or forty of those in a oh. row. <laughs> God, if you get baked, man. You told me that too when you were when I was in Louisiana. You're like, man, it's. It's humid here, and you get that heat in Dallas, man. It's 30 days straight of 100 degrees. And sure enough, every summer I send you a picture of the temperature. Yeah. I'm like, yep, we're in the middle of it. It just started. The blast <laughs> furnace is cooking. And, brother, you go out there, and it don't freaking rain for two months straight, and you're just getting nope. cooked. Nope. Go out there to cut the grass, and you're dripping wet in two minutes' time. <laughs> It was God, it brutal. And I'm, and I'm thinking to myself, you mean to tell me they had people sitting in that sportatorium in the middle of July in Dallas? God. Oh well, yeah. I mean, it, it would be it would be at least you know being enclosed with a uh, with the people packed in there. It would be 110, 120 underneath the lights. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and I they, you know, the promoter would tell you, "Yeah, I need a, I need you to go thirty minute Broadway." <laughs> You're like, <laughs> and you're like "Oh man, all right." So we take it slow and easy, but <laughs> it's still wearing you. It's wearing you out. <laughs> and Mark, yeah. in those days too, in those days we didn't fly. We used to get in the cars and drive. Right, right, right. You know, we yeah. work in Dallas, and we we may have to be in uh, Houston, San Antonio, the next show. Dang. You know, so it was after after working in a hundred degrees in a sportatorium, and you're you're you're, they're not, you're going to get in a car that probably doesn't have AC at that time in that era. <laughs> <laughs> well, some of them did if it worked. <laughs> if it worked, that was it. Ah. <laughs> Yeah, I can. I can't I tried imagine. To, 
I, w- I was fortunate. I got to ride with Akbar a lot, but because uh, he always had rent a cars. But I'm telling you, you know, you get you're all warmed up, you're all heated up. You jump in the shower. They're saying, "Come on, come on, we got to go. We got to hit this next town." And you're all hot, sweaty after you did your match, and then you get in that car and you cool off in that car. And the time you stopped to get gas, get something to eat, the time you got out of that car, you were so stoved up. <laughs> you know, it take you, take you 15 minutes to, to walk to the bathroom inside the door, <laughs> grab something to eat, and then go the other 250, 275 miles to the town. And Plenty of time spent on the road. Sometimes we'd get a hotel. Sometimes we'd uh, just pull into a rest stop, and you know, it was spend fifty bucks for two hours in a hotel, or grab some sleep in the uh, in the rest stop, and go on. You know, go to the arena, and hopefully they'd have a shower there where you could take a shower go and try to find a nice, cool place to take a nap, go get something to eat, try to find some place to work out, come back to the show, and do it all over again. Uh, and what you described, well, everybody that's listening needs to know that was seven days a week. Oh, yeah. That wasn't, that wasn't oh, I'm going to do this on a Friday, Saturday, Sunday. That was every day. That was every day. Sometimes every day to earn a living. Sometimes we'd work twice on Sundays. Yep, every every day. That's hey, yeah, that's incredible. I can remember I can remember uh, doing a matinee on Christmas morning, and then doing a, a Christmas night show like around eight o'clock. Yeah, there goes your Christmas. <laughs> yeah. And hey, it, Christmas. It, it's wonder why, you know, the boys went through so many women, you know, divorces and stuff. Oh, I, I mean, it, nobody ever had to tell me that. I, I kind of saw that just from, from day one. It, it got, it, you know, you, when you're on an indie show, if you, it, the promoter brings in different names and, you know, they bring in the, the, the you know, the guy who's going to draw. And so, you know, I, I would always see, like, for example, um, Chris Adams come and Iceman would come in and, uh, any host of, of people on different shows that I was on where, you know, different names were coming down. And, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it was, you know, they would even explain it. You know, I'd say, man, I'm always gone. I mean, how can I, you know, yeah, I got a wife, but it, it's hard. <laughs> you know, not to not to go off on a tangent, but you know, I'll let everybody listen and figure it out. But guys are gone all the time. They're gone seven days a week. How do you maintain a marriage? I mean, it just seems like something that'd be impossible. It's hard enough to do it when you're home all the time, much less on the road seven days a week. Yeah, when you're gone, <laughs> when you're gone, yeah. it's like, you just, uh, there's it, very, so, there was few guys that, uh, that stayed married, but there was the majority that, you know, they wanted that White House picket fence, but forgot about being on that road so much and being gone that there was no way no way it was going to work out. So it's too, it's too hard. I mean, like you know, I, I'm involved with my kids with youth sports, and I I couldn't do that if I was on the road all the time. I mean, just no. You know. uh, so even even beyond just you know uh, being a husband, it's you know you got kids. How you how you going to be a parent? It you're gone all the time. It's, it's, it, it it would be impossible. It's just not a it's a, that's a that's a definite sacrifice that guys who didn't make it stayed on the road all the time. You know, hey, they made it in one way in life, but man, their kids, man, their kids didn't have a parent around at all. Yeah, absentee father, absentee husband. You know, that's it, man. I mean, just that's so. You know, it, you pay the price. I mean, I don't know. I've heard Flair say that. He he talked on on different interviews. You know, yeah, man, I'm I'm. You know, as popular as I can be, but you know, I wasn't around for my kids at all. You know, it just you yeah, know, it's just always it's going. unfair. It's unfair, you know. But uh, yeah, 
when you when you're in your twenties, you don't you don't think about that. No, <laughs> no, really don't. You think I don't think you start thinking about it until four until well, I don't say until forty, but you kind of start waking up in your late thirties and you know you yeah get your late forty 30s, range forty forties. You're like, man, your kids are full grown. And where'd the time go? And you come home and it's like you know you're you're reintroducing yourself to your wife and <laughs> it's uh it just it doesn't work <laughs> yeah it's a you said it man it's a it's it's a rough uh it's a rough life and and you lived it and went through it and uh i man i got all i've i've told you this a lot of times i think i texted you when you had your last injury and you weren't going to work anymore like man, there's a lot of people I met, but man, they need more ride prices in a wrestling business because you were, man, you were always top notch, man. You were nice and always helpful. I swear, I never sensed a bit of ego ever, and I just, uh, it was amazing. You took me on the road with you once or twice, or uh, actually more than once or twice, but the uh, different shows in Texas, always helpful, you know. I, they they need they they definitely needed to be more ride prices in a wrestling business and uh well, you know hopefully the new crowd there there will be but I've told you that before but I should tell you that again. I appreciate that man. It just it's not for the faint of heart and you know you you uh, you you're giving up you're selling your body and you know I've seen. I've seen some people sell their souls to get that push, you know, and I, I always uh, always knew I could go further, but I wasn't willing to 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 sell my soul to do so. Yeah, to be, uh, you know, the to wear to wear a strap, or I guess even even go for the bigger money. I just uh, came to the point where it was like I'm not gonna I gotta look myself in the mirror you know and I just uh, for me it wasn't worth it no I, I I hear you I do you 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 know, that's one thing about you you were always uh straight up and really honest and, uh yeah they need I say it I mean it man there needs to be more people like you in the, in the business it would be a whole lot better if uh there was and uh no, you're right. You can't you can't sell your soul and no. You know, guys that do that, if, they, if that's what makes them happy, yeah, they can live with themselves. You know, good for them. I I, I I agree. It's not something that uh that I'd want to do. Hey, so before before we wrap up, I I gotta ask you from your uh, global time because I actually met these these two guys, but uh, I wanted to just hear your thoughts on. Uh, I'll say two names and um and uh you just you just respond to whatever. So. Uh, first name I'll say is uh, Chris Adams because I know you knew him. I, I actually met him too, you know, years ago when he was working uh, after the Global Days and whatnot in WCCW in the Indies. And uh, so, uh, Chris Adams, go ahead, whatever you want to say. All right, Chris was a Chris was a was a really good guy when he was sober. Yep. <laughs> and. You know when he when he drank he was he was Jekyll and Hyde man. I saw that one night at a club with him. Well, you know he that had a funny history, you say that a history of it. Uh, going back from headbutt and a pilot or co-pilot on a on a plane because he got drunk and uh, they cut him off and. He got so boisterous that uh, the co-pilot came out and told him, no, you know, you're done, you're cut off, sit down, be quiet. And then he ended up headbutting the uh, co-pilot. And yeah. they, had, they did an emergency landing, and they had uh, some federal marshals waiting for him, picked him up, and, you know, he did... Did a little time for that, and and I heard other stories about about him and getting drunk and doing some stuff, you know, being abusive to some women. 
and you know he was he was a great guy when he was sober, but uh, you get that he got to that point where he'd have you know so much alcohol or whatever else in him, and you know he was uh, Mr. Hyde. He would uh, he would just turn. You you didn't you didn't want to be around him. <laughs> He, you know, I, saw, I actually saw it one night. Uh, it was after it was after a show we were on. Uh, this was right before I met you, actually, probably a, I don't know six months or so. And uh, he uh, he he was at a club with uh with with all the guys, and and he was uh, putting them down. And man, he went from from you know just mellow and relaxed, and you know kind of the you know that old Chris Adams smile to uh-huh. just. Man, he was ready to rip a couple of guys' heads off, and I'm like, "What the heck?" Is, you know, I, that was the first time I had saw it. I had heard it, but never had seen it. You know, I'm I'm just a young guy in the in the business at that point. I'm like, "Man, what the heck?" But yeah, he uh, <laughs> I saw it firsthand. It was uh, it was pretty incredible. Nothing happened, but it's only because he was drug out of the place, uh, out of the club. So um, yeah, I, I hear you. I, I, I saw that part, and I had heard it many a times, but it is what it is. So God rest his soul. I know he's been gone for a while now, and um, but uh, yeah, I, it was funny uh, that you had that same impression, or I'd seen some of it. All right, so the other name I'm gonna give you is uh, Iceman King Parsons. Iceman, man, I I, I loved Ice to death. He was uh, he was a good guy. I mean, he he helped me out, you know. He would always uh, give me pointers. He just, uh, he had opportunities, but I think his, I think his ego kind of uh, shot himself in the foot on some, uh, on some opportunities that he could have, uh, gone further and and did a lot better but Iceman yeah, he's on top of my list I, I love Iceman King Parsons no doubt I haven't seen him since uh, probably 97 or so uh, but he was uh, he was always funny I just hanging around him uh, he would be the life of the party but he he was uh, like I never saw him like get get out get get crazy I mean he just was a uh, yeah, he just no, he was, he, he, he was, he was always low key, always low yeah. key. Yeah, he he was funny though, and he'd tell some jokes and stuff in the back. Ice, and, uh, Ice was uh, kept the locker room alive, that's for sure. Yeah, yeah, he was. Uh, but uh, no, it's. Um, I brought his uh, his name up too because I, I love to kid you about the lawn chair. Um, he's when he set wrestling ahead 20 years at that point Um, (laughs) greatest angle or match I've ever seen in history Iceman King Parsons and Rod Price in the uh, infamous lawn chair match (laughs) you can come clean now and tell me that was your idea if you'd like (laughs) no that was uh, that's when Global uh, decided to start bringing in writers (laughs) <laughs> they would write these scripts out. We'd just sit back there and shake our heads. <laughs> <sighs> I told you the story, man. I was sitting there looking at that when years before I knew you going, why are they in the ring with lawn chairs? <laughs> hey, and then it re-aired not that long ago on ESPN. So, uh, you can yeah, uh, I think you told me about them. Yeah. <laughs> Gotta love it, man. The faint, the infamous lawn chair. So, uh, <laughs> hey, but I, I don't want to. Uh, I don't want to keep you much longer. Uh, so, uh, um, no, man. Anything else you want to talk about or share from your time? I, I appreciate you spent a lot of time with me, and and uh, you helped me out on you know on numerous occasions with different things, and I've always been appreciative of that. And and for people who don't know you, they should because you had a really, really good and long career. No, you weren't, you know, what they saw on TV on every Monday Night Raw. But one thing about when you're in the wrestling business, you learn to realize that just because you're on Monday Night Raw, 
not not knocking the guys that are there, but you know, just because you don't see a guy there does not mean he did not have immense talent like you and was not a great you know individual talent such as you. I mean, you had all the skills from what I saw. It just it, no, it doesn't mean anything that you weren't there. Uh, there's a lot of uh, a lot of politics involved, and you know, a lot of it's being in the right place at the right time, and and like I said, when uh, when I got back from Europe, I'd shaved my head. Austin had shaved his head, and Goldberg was out. So, you know, yeah, they want they they wanted to use me, but uh, didn't know what to do with me. So, and and, and a lot of people don't realize that's uh, that's. That's a lot. It's a big part of it. I mean, you know that, that it, it had nothing to do with your ability. You had it. You were there. It's just like they said. They they didn't have anything to do with you, and unfortunately, you kind of at their mercy. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, man. And just so you know, I came unglued when when Austin was interviewing Heyman on his podcast last week, and he dropped Rod Price's name. <laughs> I yeah, came unglued. I I heard that. I heard that. Uh, I heard that Paul brought it up, and I, I didn't hear the. Uh, I didn't hear the broad the podcast, but I, I heard uh, bits and pieces. So yeah, you know, as long as your name's still out there, gotta, hey, gotta, yeah, gotta mean something. Got, it, <laughs> it, it, it means a lot because you, you know he's not going to say that on that platform. If it doesn't mean anything, so uh, right. right. Hey, man, you, you're held in high regards by a lot more people than uh, than 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 you you probably ever will realize. So I'm glad you're doing well. I'm actually glad I got to catch up with you because I hadn't talked to you in so long. And good, good, good to hear fun. things are going well. I appreciate well. you. I appreciate you uh, thinking about me and and being on your podcast, man. Really do hope to get to Dallas soon and see everybody. Yeah, 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 no problem. I'm going to keep going. Like I said, I just started this thing, and uh, we'll see where it goes. But I knew when I started it, I needed to talk to you because I uh, probably knew you better than I, I knew you better than anyone. Uh, you would, Let me say this. Just from everything I've known about you, a straight shooting guy, never pulled punches, but at the same time very respectful, I, like, that's the person I need to talk to. And the fact that I knew you well and can get you on the phone was uh, was, was was just a plus. So. You know, I'm glad I got to talk to you and catch up. And uh, tell Julia I said hello. Uh, I hadn't seen I her sure ever. And, uh, I sure will. Things are going well. Thank so you so you, much. You, no problem. You hang in there, man, and uh, and uh, I, I, I'll catch you later. All right, buddy. Thank you. All right, so like I said, that was taken – or that was recorded on – in June of 2016, 2015 with the California stud, Rod Price. Rod has joined a couple of other times on the show. So if you do pull up our podcast uh, feed, Booking the Territory, however you get your podcast from its iTunes, Podbean, Stitcher, um, do me a favor. Uh, give us a rating on it. Hopefully you enjoyed the show and uh, you will give us five stars on iTunes or Stitcher. Um, but uh, not only that, you can go back and check out uh, Rod was on right after Roddy Piper passed away in 2015. Rod had met Piper, shared some stories with us about Roddy Piper. And then um, Rod was on again right uh, before WrestleMania when he was inducted into the what's known as the Southern Wrestling Hall of Fame. A big time, uh, uh, big time weekend because it was WrestleMania weekend and it was done at the NWA Parade of Champions show, uh, which was held by um, uh, IHWE, uh, held it uh, in Fort Worth, Texas. So Rod was inducted into the Southern Wrestling Hall of Fame that weekend, and it was a uh, you know he came on the show to share his appreciation for that uh, small induction to the uh to the to the hall of fame he like i think he told me i don't remember if it was when we were recording or not but he said uh you know it's not the uh, wwe hall of fame but hey man it's a hall of fame so he joked about making me kiss his ring <laughs> but anyway so uh that's gonna wrap up this week's youtube episode of booking the territories pro wrestling podcast i appreciate you tuning in check us out um weekly like i said on our on our normal uh itunes audio feed stitcher podcast attic 
uh, tune in radio, however you get your podcast from. We are audio. We are an audio podcast that drops every Tuesday, soon to be moving to every Thursday. But uh, check us out, and we'd appreciate uh, if you subscribe to the show. Thanks again. I appreciate you tuning in to this week's episode of, YouTube, of our YouTube channel and our interview. Catch you later.